the moment that actually comes to mind as, as you're asking this question is, my father died when I was uh, 24 years old. Um, and he was everything to me. He was my whole world, uh, as we said earlier. I, I pretty much constructed all of my scaffolding for what I thought life should be like according to what he believed and what he thought. And, and so when he died, I don't want to say suddenly, but within a year, he died of a very virulent cancer. I was not at all prepared. I told him I was prepared, but I really wasn't. I was devastated. And I really didn't know, because I had spent my whole life trying to please him, I really didn't know what to do next with myself. And I vividly remember the night before the memorial service that we had at our house, my mother's house, um, I was up all night crying. I was hysterical because I really didn't know how I was supposed to live. And I felt like he visited me that night. Welcome, Janet Granger, to Sunday Communion Podcast. So happy to have you. So excited to be here. So much to discuss. Yeah. Well, like to start out with some background so that our audience has an idea of uh, how you grew up a little bit, where you grew up, what your foundation is, because you know who we are as an adult is very much steeped in how we grew up. Mm hmm in our patterns and our programs. So take it away, Janet, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, so I grew up uh, in the Northeast. Uh, I grew up in Connecticut in a very traditional family. Uh, and my father was a doctor and my mother was a journalist, although very few women worked in those days. So she tried to keep it to part time because in those days, women were told like if they worked out of the home, their children would become juvenile delinquents. So that was a thing. Um, and uh, I was uh, very, I came from a family of very successful, educated people. I remember being drilled in my head that like all four of your grandparents went to college. And so great things are expected of you. And by great things, that meant like college and a graduate degree and A's and... Okay, and you owned that, right? So you, you grew totally, up in that 100%. great foundation. I was, okay. yes, and spent decades of my life that way. Mm -hmm. And what about any spirituality foundation? Did you grow up in a religious family? Um, no, we were, we were what I call, what I like to call bagel Jews, meaning, okay. um, my father did not believe in organized religion, but it was steeped in a very Jewish moral, ethical culture of, you know, education is the most important thing and, um, being good to other people and doing good deeds. And it was, it was spiritual in the sense of the ethics we didn't ever set foot in temple as a family. Um, interestingly enough, my mother <laughs> um, always throughout my entire life had episodes of ESP. And they were always sort of laughed over, but they were, they even, it even got to the point where they were documented. Um, she and her best friend growing up, Maria, uh, who ended up being my godmother, even though Jewish families don't have <laughs> godmothers. Um, but Maria was brought up Catholic, so she wanted to be my godmother. So she is. Um, they would talk all the time telepathically. And it meant a lot to Maria to get tested. So in the early 1970s, they actually went into Maimonides Hospital. and were They tested. went into where? Maimonides Hospital. Where's Ellen, that? In New York. Okay. Tested by scientists, you know, guys in white coats who had these envelopes. They were, you know, these envelopes 
that were not to be opened until they went off to separate ends of the hospital. And um, my mother said when we got to whatever little room we were in in the hospital, you know, secluded away, they opened up the envelope and inside was a collage of pictures that had been pasted together. And the test was an hour for 30 minutes she sent to Maria and for 30 minutes Maria sent back to her. And what the scientists would do would take notes and they'd have a stopwatch to figure out like where, you know, or what minute they said something. Um, and they were supposed to send their picture and then receive their, the picture. So um, they came out 99% perfect. Both of them. Both of them. Um, my mother saw and heard events happen that she didn't, that she wasn't in front of. How old were you at this time? I mean, this started when I was really young. It started when I was, I remember it being like all my life that she would just know things. Um, I remember going to camp and having going to an awful, awful camp and I wanted to come home and I went to a pay phone. So I, I, maybe I was 10, 11 years old or something and uh called and she wasn't home and then i got to another payphone i don't know a couple hours later and called and she picked up well what had happened is she had heard coins dropping in to a phone machine while she was playing tennis and she heard my voice going mommy mommy and she literally like walked off the tennis court got in her car drove home to be there the second time that i called from the payphone in maine so i mean stuff like this happened a lot enough that we all knew it and it was a family thing my father was a neurologist <laughs> doctor and he kept saying i'm married to a witch you know <laughs> so he acknowledged mm -hmm. that it was a real thing well he had to because what would happen was okay here's an example so he would get up at seven in the morning to get showered and ready and go to the office and do his rounds at the hospital and my mom would often sleep in a little bit and so what would happen is he would he would think of questions to ask her on his way out the door, like, oh, I meant to ask you, oh, I meant to ask Susan to pick up the dry cleaning. And my mother in her sleep- I'm was sorry, out, I didn't hear you. you. You meant to ask, she, he said- I you meant to ask that? Susan to pick up the dry cleaning and she'd go, okay, and go pick up the dry cleaning without him ever having. And he would say, he'd get really frustrated and go, Will you let me ask the question before you answer it? And she'd be like, but I heard you ask the question. That's fascinating. And what other type of communication did she have? Uh, was it telepathic like that only, or did she have prophetic dreams or you know, she was... she sometimes knew what was going to happen. I mean, another one, my, one of my favorite stories is she was walk. So, again, back in the seventies, um, there was an OTB, an off-track betting, a, a lot of OTB um, uh, windows in Grand Central Station. And one day she was walking to. She'd gone into New York or something. She was walking through Grand Central Station, and she heard in her head the name like I think it was Cannonade or something, and she went. Cannonade? What's Cannonade? And so she went over to the OTP and said, do you guys have a horse named Cannonade? And they were like, uh-huh. Do you want to bet or not? And she was like, sure. So she put down, I don't know, a dollar, $10 or something on Cannonade. And sure enough, it came in, you know, a 10 to one or a hundred something. Um, so she would know stuff. When she was very little, I mean, the example she gave was she'd be like five years old or six years old, and she'd wake up knowing, knowing that her aunt, aunt and uncle, like friends of the family, were coming over. So she put on like a special dress. And her mother said to her, why are you wearing a special dress today? She goes, well, because aunt so-and-so and uncle so-and-so are coming over. And her mother would go, uh, no, they're not. And sure enough, they would pop in. <laughs> surprise visit you know that's so great now did her did her siblings have this same type of communication or ability yes and no um her she has one brother and he very late in life 
I, and I say that like in his 70s, um, lost his wife and has been communicating with her. And has actually written a book about it called something like Behind the Veil. Oh, nice. So they wrote this book together after her death. And and you became aware of this recently? Yes. I think, I think you just published the book a year or two ago. Okay. And did your mom meditate? No, never. My mother never was really interested in harnessing it or okay. figuring it out. She would just do things with her friend Maria. I mean, the other story she told me was they were very young. Um, and, and when I say young, I mean, like, if we could go back and date it, but she was like nine or 10 years old and she and Maria decided to get out a Ouija board and ask mm. who's the next president going to be. And the Ouija board went to I K E. And they were like, who's Ike? Wow. Well, we all know who Ike was. That was Eisenhower. <laughs> so, um, but so they would play with it, but they didn't, Maria went on to, to do a lot more studying of it. Um, my mother, not so much. Okay. So great foundation, interesting foundation. <laughs> and you saw it as just kind of a quirky thing that was your mom, but you were very steeped in academia and uh, your business. And did you in Being some... In my head, yeah. In some way or level, did you kind of think that that was just woo woo or that, oh, yeah. that I totally if you talked it. about it or if you owned that, that there, there was some level of, um, I don't know what a judgment around it. <laughs> That's being kind. You were Trying nuts. You were nuts. If you okay. thought that that was real, you were crazy. And okay. I have heard those words from people in my family. Yeah. And did you ever say those words? No, because it was so real for me. Um, and it felt very judgmental. Um, and I love my mom. So oh. she wasn't crazy. She was just my mom. She had this, it was more of a gift. I think mm. I perceived it as, um, and, and also a, an ability, like just, just like my mom was a really good swimmer and almost trained for the Olympics in swimming. Like, so she could do the swimming and she had this ability. You know what I'm saying? Like I, it was all the same to me. And so as you were growing up and you went off to college and uh, talk to us about your career. Um, I have had, I guess, what others would look at as a very successful, serious career in marketing. Uh, I've been doing it for 30 years. I got an MBA at an Ivy League school. Um, I have worked for Fortune 500 companies. I have uh, worked uh, for years and years and years in marketing and and because I started off at a company called Nielsen, learning about market research and data analytics, I have been extremely data focused and make and like to think of myself as very logical and analytical and make decisions based on data. And in fact, in marketing, that has been a strength of mine where it's not all about, ooh, what feels good or what looks good or what I like. It's not that I have always focused on what's not the subjective part, but what can be measured. And so to me, it's always been analytics, data, measurement, um, because that's what made me, has made me most successful, frankly. So I've been down this very linear path and it's worked. And in that success, you have then started your own business. Yes. And how long ago did you do that? So I started my own business eight years ago. Um, I had had my own consulting business in the early 2000s, but it was in a di very different area, some new product development. So um, in 2016, I left Pitney Bowes and started my own consulting business. Um, I moved to Florida from the Northeast, um, got married uh, to someone in the marine and maritime industry. And I've been doing this ever since. And I've written a couple of books about it, about um, working with younger generations, 
Um, so yeah, I've had my own marketing agency since 2016. And those books, the names of those books? Uh, well, the one that just came out is called The Secret to Managing Gen Z, the handbook. Uh, that's available on Amazon. I don't have a copy of it yet because I don't, don't even have my author copies. Um, and the one before that is OK Boomer. Revelations Which I have and I've read is amazing. Of a baby boomer working with millennials. So, um, so they're all about my experience as a marketer working with younger teams and uh, understanding how to um, basically get the best out of younger teams. Um, I, I don't have the same confusion that many people have about how to best work with younger people because I understand where they're coming from. So a lot of what I do is explain sort of the greater context of where younger people are coming from and, and how to best work with them. Well, if you could choose just one impactful item from each of your books, like let's do, um, let's do the boomer. Let's do digital influence for baby boomers. Ooh, the first one. Um, digital influence for baby boomers, I wrote back in 2016 because I was seeing that a lot of people my age were very intimidated by uh, the digital world, digital transformation. And my goal was to tell them it doesn't matter when it, or where or how you start, start and it, it, you, can, you can do it. Um, so that was the message was it's not that bad if you take it step by step and you do it logically. Um, and you can do this, even though you're at that point in your fifties. Uh, um, all your, the, the books will have links to your books in the description box. So it'll be easy to access those and, um, okay. Uh, boomer revelation of a baby boomer working with millennials. So the revelation, I mean, the, the, the aha sort of takeaway moment in that book is, um, Everyone is working, everyone's brain in our decision-making processes um, has our decision-making faculties in the emotional part of the brain. I'm gonna say that again. All of our decision-making faculties literally lie in the emotional part of the brain. So to deny that our emotions are part of our decision-making process, um, means that you're you're not understanding not only how you make decisions but how you work with everybody around you and that decisions a lot of your decisions about people are being driven by your emotions um and would that also include judgments it does it includes judgments so to get back to the example i gave earlier i like to think of myself as a very analytical person very data focused etc what it means for me is that I like to gather, I'm a gatherer of things. I gather data, information, proof points, et cetera. I gather enough of the points, the, the data to make myself comfortable to make a decision. Okay, That's right. where the emotion comes in. And then your latest book. My latest book, The Secret to Managing Gen Z, the aha takeaway moment is, um, they grew up in a very different time than we grew up and understanding that context and empathizing a bit with at least what they're coming with can help managers and leaders to then change how they're doing business so that it works for them. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think um, I'm just going to do a plug for mindfulness because in all of those cases, if we are more mindful awareness and non-judgment, we can be mindful of the way that someone else is navigating or making their decisions, uh, we can then be the observer of that and utilize that more equanimous state to get what we want, the end result, but without resistance. Right? It's all about mindfulness late. Yeah. <laughs> you are like absolutely think so. right. A hundred percent. This is why I'm such a big fan. Oh, well, thank you. Ditto. Um, so there's, you know, so many different uh, categories to cover, but as we are working through childhood and coming up through adulthood and, and looking at next chapters, 
uh, because so much of our lives, we are often looking towards the future, <laughs> right? And sometimes that brings in a lot of stress because we're always grasping and looking to the future or we're thinking about the past. Whereas with uh, a mindful approach, we are looking to really be in a state of, state of peace in the moment. But we do have evolution and new chapters. So what would you say your greatest up to this point uh, next chapters brought you and, and, and how did you push through the fear of, and it may be you starting your new business, right? Eight years ago. How did you come to the decision of being able to push through any fear or any resistance to this next chapter? That's a great question. I, I would say that I've had fear and resistance all the way. And what's helped me through it is two things. One is the more present I am and grateful I am, the happier I am. And that happiness and contentment and peace becomes in a way sort of self-perpetuating. It, 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 it encourages me to continue in that path. Um, Beautifully so happy. Um, the other thing is I have surrounded myself with people who support me in, as I work through my fear. I think it's really, really important um, to have people who can, you know, help you move forward. There, there's an image I have in my head, and I don't know if it's from one of the Monty Python movies or something, but I think it was in the Monty Python movie that the... Um, the Holy Grail, where the knight steps off the cliff over the chasm with the, the faith, right, that, that, that it will come up to meet him, right, not understanding that it was like glass or something. So he would be supported. But, but it's knowing, it's the knowing, and it's the faith to take that step out and to have other people, you know, holding your hand as you do that, because it's really freaking terrifying to step out over nothing. And yet every time the universe does come up to meet me, if that makes sense. Oh, 100%. So. And it's a great segue into our uh, spiritual segment <laughs> part. Um, where has spirituality changed for you over the years? And was there a point in time that you can pinpoint that you realized, oh, there's more to this story, that I am more spiritual than I am intellectual or something to that extent? Wow, what a great question. I, I don't know that I can pinpoint a moment, the moment that actually comes to mind as, as you're asking this question is, My father died when I was uh, 24 years old. Um, and he was everything to me. He was my whole world. Uh, as we said earlier, I, I pretty much constructed all of my scaffolding for what I thought life should be like according to what he believed and what he thought. And, and so when he died, I don't want to say suddenly, but within a year, he died of a very virulent cancer. I was not at all prepared. I told him I was prepared, but I really wasn't. I was devastated. And I really didn't know, because I had spent my whole life trying to please him, I really didn't know what to do next with myself. And I vividly remember the night before the memorial service that we had at our house, my mother's house, um, I was up all night crying. I was hysterical because I really didn't know how I was supposed to live. And I felt like he visited me that night. And while I spent a lot of time suppressing that memory and not believing it, when it happened, it was so real. And I think that was the beginning 
of thinking, oh, there's really something else out there that I don't know about and I haven't figured out. Beautiful. <laughs> um, 24 years old, you're a young woman to have lost the rock in your life. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to have the gift of that communication, if you don't mind me asking, what did that communication look like or feel like? Um, I mean, I'm not going to go into all the detail because otherwise I'll be a mess. But basically it was, it was like, <laughs> so he came to me really annoyed, which was very much like my dad. What? You keep your personality, yeah, on yeah. the other He's side. Like, what? What do you want? Because I was like, I need you, I need you, I need you. I couldn't stop saying I need you. So he shows up and he's like, what? And I, <laughs> I remember being like, um, so sorry to bother you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 and, and I basically was like, I don't, I'm, I'm not complete. There's a part of me missing now and I don't know what to do about it. And I remember him going, oh, fine. Exasperated. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're fine. Um, and he sort of filled in that piece for me. Mm. It was like, how can I explain it? It was almost like showing him a, a, like an empty grave site and he was the bulldozer and he just like shoveled in the dirt. Like there's no more a hole. You're he good. filled in the space. He filled, he filled in, the, in void. the space. And I went, Oh, okay. <laughs> now was this all it, were your eyes closed? Were your eyes open? Were you lying down? Did I was you lying down it was like two or was three it or in four your head? o'clock in the morning. I was lying down in my bed and I felt him behind me, but I was too terrified to look. <laughs> Because there was a part of me that was terrified that I would see something. And then there was a part of me that was terrified that I wouldn't see something. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do anything. I just showed him what I needed. And he was like, ugh. And he filled in the dirt and he went away. And, and he's so like, you felt now you're it okay. viscerally. I'm sorry? You felt it viscerally. I felt it viscerally. I felt it like in my body. Hmm. It was like, I felt it, and I was going to sound weird, but I kind of felt it in my back and my shoulder blades. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, was were you immediately, like, was the grief, did it subside? No, the grief it took years to subside. It was more the, the panic and the inability to go on was gone. I never felt incapable again. Mm -hmm. um, it was like he fixed it. Great. Did you ever hear from him again? Yeah, he'd come back quite a few times after that. Um, <laughs> again, with that sort of saucy attitude, like what? You're fine. So he didn't come on on his own, only when you were beckoning him, when you were calling upon him. Right. Okay. So you're Because first... I'm sure in his mind, like, you don't need me, you're fine. And he's happy. <laughs> like... <laughs> Did he I don't know if instrument? happy so much as like done. He, I get the very much a sense like he'd moved on, like he was done. And this was bringing him back. Like, what? I, you know what I mean? I, yeah, it was, I do. Yeah. Did he, did he play an instrument? Yes, he played the piano. Okay. It, it felt like he was in a band, like there was like a trio that he was playing with on the other side. <laughs> oh, oh, that would be interesting. Okay, so now we've opened this door of these otherworldly communications. Did you share that with anyone? Did no. you keep that very private? And I think you may be the first person I've told right here on this podcast. So yeah. I know we don't have a whole big following at this point, <laughs> but 
but you are sharing it with others now. So thank you for doing that. You are in a safe space of Thanks. believers. Um, and so have you opened up? I know you have, but when, I guess is the better question. When, after that experience, did you really start exploring spiritual existence? Oh, decades later. I buried that like a hot potato. I mean, I... <laughs> Um, because when we met, yeah, I was not, yeah, I buried it. Deep. Let's talk about those chapters and because that, <laughs> that's the juicy bits I like to get to. Um, so we met pre COVID. So 2019, we met 2019. Okay. A mutual friend. We're going to do a shout out to PK. Shout out PK. Us. And we were introduced in the meetings and events world. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we had some time together with a nice uh, group of friends and explored some spiritual, well, I'm just going to say toe dipping. <laughs> yeah, you did a reading for me, which was transformational, which was amazing. And, and were you open to the reading at that time? Oh, totally. You I was were. totally open. Okay. You, you had me hook, line, and sinker. I was like, yeah. And and what about it made you open? I have no idea. I just... I get a sense about people. I always have. And I know things about people. Um, and I knew that I needed to listen to you and trust you. Well, thank you. Um, so that intuitive nature that mm -hmm. you have had all along, you used in your business Always. environment, but probably Always. never called it that. Right. Right. I, you know, it's one of those things where like my mother, when other people didn't know, I'm like, how could you not know? <laughs> right. <laughs> so we had a nice conversation recently and we were talking about your next chapter and your next chapter is really stepping out into uh a a different yeah <laughs> different realm and literally and um let's chat about that so what are you doing now what are you studying what's happening so um i have been in love with animals my entire life and my next chapter is animal communication telepathic communication and what does my whole life mean? I mean, like I didn't even play with Barbie dolls when I was a kid. I played with stuffed animals. I was totally only into animals. I wanted to be a zoologist, you know, that, that qualified as being a scientist, right? So being a zoologist, that's what I told people as a kid I was going to do. And I lost my way. I lost my path. And, um, so one of the ways I, I found it again was, um, after I got, uh, divorced back in 2010, I want to say, nine, 2009, 2010. The first thing I did for me was get a dog, um, which was totally natural. I hadn't had a dog because I was married to someone with allergies, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I, I, I had felt deprived for decades that I didn't have a dog. And, and um, I thought it was very natural that the first thing that I would do as soon as I was separated was get a dog. Other people thought that was insane, but I got a dog. I tell people I got a dog for me like that. And I, and, very I looked, healing. and it was amazing. I wish, I mean, I, I have suffered from depression in bouts my whole life. I wish a counselor had said, you know what? You really should get a dog because it cured all of it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I look at getting Chelsea as finding my way back. Getting Chelsea was the start of sort of finding my way back. And I decided to do this animal communication thing. Um, it's funny because I bought a book a few years ago, started to try to read it, and it didn't make any sense to me. It was literally like trying to read Greek. Um, um, and I. But you believed in the possibility back then, several yes, years ago. I was intrigued with the possibility. Intrigued. And and by having uh, Chelsea, and and probably as a child when you had pets, um, you believe that that animals have souls. Absolutely, that, totally. That, 
Yeah. They were people too. Animals yeah. are people too, as far as I was concerned. They And we had, I mean, my parents treated our pets like they were their children. I'll never forget, my brother and I would be so jealous. My father would come home from the office, take off his jacket, take off his tie. And the first thing he did was play with the dog for five minutes. And we all had to wait <laughs> until he was done playing with the dog to, to get any attention whatsoever. <laughs> Unconditional love, animals, well. Um, yeah. I'm going to give a shout out to uh, a couple other podcast episodes um, that I think if you haven't seen, you would love. Um, Maria Hosmer, uh, also a very big uh, animal advocate, and um, and Donna Stidham um, is a uh, an attorney and does estate planning and very big in animal welfare and and preparing for your animals so um and here we are again we have a theme going so, <laughs> so talk to me more about that then you bought the book and and it was kind of like maybe like a secret fun thing that you were doing and, and then yeah. what what happened after that and um so i have been working i have a colleague who's on her own shamanic journey and I have been supporting her and she was an executive coach and she sort of has sort of turned in this other direction and I have been supporting her and watching her and listening to her and I think she and I have kind of helped each other along this spiritual path and so she she was sort of like the plow as it were plowing the snow uh, to make my way forward and then I um Earlier this year, uh, I listened to an animal communication podcast and I heard a woman named Ann Gordon talk about um, swimming with uh, whales and dolphins. And I thought, oh, that's so cool, that's so cool. And she did what I tell everyone to do when they you know, do a guest co podcast, which is she had what what's called an IFO, an irresistible free offer. And her irresistible free, bull, free offer was um, uh, give me your email, basically. I mean, it comes down to give me your email and I'll give you, uh, a, and you can meet your dolphin spirit guide. And I was like, oh, yes, I will give you my email so I can meet your, you know. So she had this whole, you downloaded it like an M MPV uh, v file to listen, you know, to listen. And I met my dolphin spiritual guide. And I was like, that's it, I'm hooked. So then after that, I, you know, contacted her and went, hey, you don't know me, but I downloaded your free offer and now I'm doing the next thing again, which I, as a marketer, tell people to do. I'm contacting you. What else have you got? And she's like, well, I have these trips. So I ended up this summer going and swimming with wild dolphins. Um, Where was that? Um, it's off the coast of Bimini uh, mm -hmm. in the Bahamas. Nice. And oh my God, life changing. Mm -hmm. Life changing. So now I have really, really been visited with dolphins um, and have my dolphin spiritual guide. And um, they have told me that this is what I'm doing. So, um, so, so yeah. <laughs> I am bleh, hook, line and sinker, as they say. <laughs> when we were chatting before, I used a phrase that we both um, kind of joked about and acknowledged. And it was one that a friend of mine, oh my gosh, uh, we had two friends when I had the wellness center, um, Wendy and Brenda, who ha are both on the other side. So I know that they're listening and they're, they're chuckling. I can hear Wendy now. Um, but we used to say stepping out of the psychic closet because, yeah. you know, when you are a business person and you're very grounded and, and all of us were very much in the business world. And then all of a sudden you know that there's something far beyond these five senses that we have and all of these abilities, but you might be a little further ahead than the mainstream is. And you feel kind of secretive about it because you don't want to be ridiculed. Right. Um, and you, well, as do you said, not judged. want to be There's dismissed or judged yeah. or yeah. right. And so, um, so we started using the term that we're going to start stepping out and, and out of the psychic closet. And we did, but it was still a safe environment because of the wellness center. 
And then when I segued out of the wellness center and went into the meetings and events industry and was also doing very grounded work with mindfulness and meditation about stress relief. And, um, and yes, people were having some spiritual experiences, uh, but still kind of keeping that a little separate. And now this year, bringing the two together with the near-death experience book and bringing the uh, business people in who who have these experiences and making it more mainstream to say, hey, yeah, yeah, I'm an animal communicator. I'm also a kick-ass, I don't know, can I say that on a pod- podcast? Um, <laughs> marketer. Yeah, yeah you, can, you can be both because now you are a whole being. You are a spiritual being having this physical experience. And yes, we have these senses and abilities far beyond the five limited ones that we have been taught that we have. So talk to me about your spirit communications. When we chatted, uh, your son's cat came up. Yes, yes. So um, so I took this first sort of beginner's course with uh, Penelope Smith, who is sort of the grandmother of animal communication, and um, and sort of felt the validation of, you know, she she tested us. She's like, I'm sending out these images. What are you seeing? And, you know, you commit, you write it down and then it comes back and she shows you the picture. It's like, oh, yeah, I, I got that. I actually. So it's it's been wonderful to have that validation of, mm-hmm. yeah, I did. I got it. So, you know, I'm not crazy. I am well, it's the, the, the data driven experience exactly. for you, uh, right? For me. Yeah. <laughs> data. I need data. Um, so so. So you don't know this. So let me tell you, oh, Lee, this was fabulous. So you said to me, oh, so go talk to your black cat. Your black cat has volunteered to talk to you. And I said to you, yeah, I don't have a cat. And in my head, I'm thinking, cat? I am so not a cat person. No, no cat. And you said, oh, oh, weird. Uh, Is there someone in your family who has a cat? And I said, oh, you mean my son, Scott? His cat's name, his black cat's name is... um, uh, oh, I'm blanking on it now. Um, Rocco. Rocco. Thank you. And you said, yes, Rocco. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's talk to Rocco. <laughs> you were judging me. <laughs> no, I wasn't judging you. It was more like cats are so outside of my comfort zone. So outside. Wait. So I went and I've been doing these. I, I go to an isolation tank. I do. I float. Um, and I do, yeah, I, and it's a great, because I'm so ADHD, it's not a crutch, but I get very distracted. So what's great about it is I can have these experiences because everything else is deprived. So I'm lying there last weekend. And first thing I do, as soon as I settle in is I'm like, oh, Rocco, let's talk. So I'm like, we connect. And I said, uh, so how are you? And he's like, fine. I thought, okay, uh, are you are you happy at Scott's house? And I saw him sitting on the top of the stairs the way he, he does and surveying his domain of the apartment and the outside windows and the views. And he's like, yeah, I'm good. And I thought, okay, um, do you need anything? And he says, uh, I'm a little thirsty. <laughs> I thought, Oh my God, this is, this is not good. Um, so finally I just stopped asking questions and I just lay there thinking, uh, okay, whatever. Uh, he came to me and as soon as I did that, he goes, uh, yeah, that's not, this is what this is about. And I okay, say, repeat that. He said, what? That's not what this is about. This isn't about me. This is about you. <gasps> and I went, oh, Oh, okay. And I'm lying there in this isolation tank laughing. Now I'm like laughing that I came at this thinking, oh, he needs me or he needs something or he has something that he wants to say to Scott, you know, my son. And he's like, no, this is about you. And I went, that's awesome. Okay. And he goes, you need to stop being afraid of cats. And I thought about it and I realized, well, yeah, I actually, I am kind of afraid of cats. And in my head, I, I, I visualized for him that like when cats have sat on my lap, they kind of dug their claws into my thighs and it really hurts. And he's like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. You got to stop worrying about that all the time. 
you have to stop being afraid of cats. <laughs> I went, uh, oh, okay. Well, if you're going to be a pet communicator, <laughs> you have to stop being afraid of cats. Yeah. And um, I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I will try to stop being afraid of cats. And he goes, yeah, that's it. And he was done. <laughs> Boom, we're done. And I was like, so then I said, um, I remember Penelope Smith saying, every cat has, um, every pet has a, a, a purpose. So I said, well, okay, so what's your purpose for Scott and Hannah? And he goes, um, I take care of them. Hmm. Um, and especially Hannah, I take care of her when she's upset, especially with work. And I, and I said, I asked, well, how do you do that? And he said, well, I sit on her lap. And the weight of me comforts her. Oh. And I was like, oh. So, so again, coming out of the closet, as we say, I decided to have this discussion with my son, Scott, who is a software engineer. <laughs> and if, <laughs> when I say engineer, I mean like mathematical, logical, whatever. And I, so I decided to have, to come out and have this conversation with him. And I said, sweetie, I need to have a conversation with you. You know, I'm into animal communication. And he's like, yes. And I said, I need to have a conversation and I hope you won't roll your eyes. And so I related this entire conversation. He was laughing hysterically. He goes, oh my God, that is so Rocco's personality. Like that is him to a T. And when I explained the thing about um, Rocco and how he comforts Hannah, he goes, oh, that makes total sense because he, he goes like sleeping with a weighted blanket i went exactly and and so i mean god bless him for not judging me he's my son and he loves me um but again to have him validate like oh my god that is so rocco i totally believe that and you see how you're helping him stretch and i think that that's Again, what we are doing with coming out of the psychic closet and having these conversations and being okay, stepping out and saying, yeah, I had a near-death experience. Yeah, I channel the other side. I speak to animals. We can do this. And the more that it becomes mainstream, the more that we are all consciously and collectively able to level up. So that becomes... Um, part of all of us. Well, my goal is to help people understand that animals have souls, mm -hmm. that they're not just things. They're not just, you know, brain receptors asking, acting on instinct. They have souls, they have spirits, they have purpose, they have meaning, um, they have learnings. I mean, I'm learning. I just learned from a young squirrel the other day, something. I, I mean, it's so profound what they have to teach us. And I just, I want to stop. I want to in some way try to stop the animal abuse and the assumption that they don't have feelings and they don't know what's going on. Um, I, I, I feel very strongly that that's sort of my purpose with this next chapter. It was my, my question, my follow-up question was, is this your purpose? Yeah, this and is my purpose. So this is your purpose for this next chapter. And, um, and do you think it's always been your life's purpose and you just oh, found it? Probably. I just took a long time getting there. It was a very meandering road. Um, what the dolphins have told me is that all of my marketing experience will come to bear and will help with this next phase, apparently. They tell me all these things that I'm like, okay. Well, and, and even that very act that you, you know, are kind of like, okay, and just accepting the guidance and surrendering to it. Do you feel like in this work that you have done over this last couple of years, few years, uh, that you, you, you really have transformed um, your personality is even different. And I think that that happens to us, right? Once we step in, we stretch and we step in uh, and do the work that we are able to really embrace the next stages without 
all the fears that we used to carry with us. Do you feel like that's a fair statement? I think that's a very fair statement. And I, there were a couple books that helped me. Um, I read The Untethered Soul mm. and The Surrender Experiment. And they were very, very helpful in helping me work through my own anxiety about, I mean, as you just said, accepting, listening, being less resistant. I don't need to know. I guess as I, I've always sort of characterized myself as a control freak and that served me well in business, but it doesn't in this aspect of life because you, all you can control is your reaction to anything. And I, I am learning to be patient and curious and accept and not judge. It's a great practice for all of us. <laughs> and my dog over here is going nuts. I don't know if you can hear all of this carrying on, but he apparently really likes being here in this conversation. Oh. Um, <laughs> okay. I've been trying so, to connect with him and he has been so like all over the place. I he not, is all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> I not know how to connect with him. When the time is right, he'll send out the SOS. Um Wow, so beautiful. Now, are you accepting any kind of engagement for this? Like, are you um, are you opening up to uh, taking clients for pet communication? Where are you in your in this stage? I I am still in my learning stages, but I would I am certainly open to anyone being curious with me. Um, I I am still learning. I'm very much a student. I'm just going to be starting my my next course with Penelope, uh, early November so that I can learn more and more how to, you know, the how to's of being an animal communicator. Um, and there's a lot to learn. You know, I have to, I have to learn how to separate myself from the messages I'm getting, you, right. you know, there's, there's, oh, yeah. there are techniques. There's, I, I, I am still in the early stages of my practice. Well, you know, even uh, there are nuances in every type of um, psychic pathway. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Maria introduced me to psychometry, which I had not worked with at all. And, um, and the idea of holding some, you know, uh, a picture uh, from someone or um, an item and getting the energy or a message from that item mm -hmm. and um, and had a blast doing it. And I was like, this is this opens up a whole nother pathway wow. uh, of understanding. And they're like new um, vocabulary, new language in each one, even the difference between a psychic reading or image or information coming through versus mediumship. There are nuances in each right. one of those that um, are distinct to them. Um, so, so do you have a special offer? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, of course not. No, I do it for everyone, but for me. Uh, no, my, my special offer uh, for anyone is I'm happy to connect with them to talk about their journey and where they may be and the fears that they may have. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that you'll share my, my contact. Absolutely. Info. Everything will be in the description box. Yep. Yeah, I am. I am very much. So I read somewhere that you're, you're most influenced by the people you spend the most time with. Right. And you have to be very careful who you spend a lot of time with. Um, I very much am looking now at this point in my life to surround myself with people who are of similar mindsets as it were. And so if anyone would like to talk or share in a positive way um, about where they are um, or just ask me about animal communication, I'm, I'm happy to chat about it. Great. Now, as we wrap up, I'd like to ask a question about um, what kind of wisdom would you like to pass on, whether it is a, a legacy of wisdom? In other words, if you passed, you transitioned tomorrow, what piece of wisdom would you like to leave who is left behind in this 3D experience or the younger generation or 
if it's more comfortable, your younger self, what piece of wisdom would you like to leave? Hmm. That, that this is real and you can live too much in your head. And, and while it's important to have that, to ignore the other is to ignore a very real part of existence and life. And um, and that to go back to what you said earlier, being present is everything. It may be the only thing, right? Because it's the only thing that's totally real. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, it's why we keep coming back. So it would be just to be totally present as much as possible all the time. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for being present with me and with everyone that's listening. It was so enjoyable. Thank you. Um, Look forward to having you back sometime. And (laughs) um, (laughs) and for the listeners and viewers, I look forward to seeing you again on our next episode. Take care. Thank you for sharing your time with us and learning more about my friend, Janet Granger. Please explore the links in the description box and like, comment, subscribe, and please hit that notification bell and also share. We get very excited by every one of you who chooses to engage. So see you next time on Sunday Communion Podcast.